Hello and welcome back. And before we start today's video, I'm just going to let you into something here. When I make these videos, I do a little bit of prep for the specifications. I set up test machines, I go through, do a little bit of research about the NAND that's inside, I look at the controller, I look at its architecture against other SSDs that I'll talk about later on in the video. But you know what? Right as I was about to start this video, I just realised I have no idea what PNY stands for. PNY, um, purple, not yellow, um... Please, no yaks. I I genuinely have no idea what PNY stands for. So before you Google and look it up in another tab, let's just think about it. What do we think PNY stands for? Like, passion fruit, not Yamaha? I, I don't know. I'm, do you know I'm going to look it up. Okay, so the answer is Paris, New York, because they distribute their products from Paris to New York. I'll be honest, I actually prefer purple, not yellow, if I'm honest, but what about XLR8? That is right. Today we are going to review and benchmark the PNY CS3140. It's part of their Gamer XLR8 series. That's right, I refuse to look up what that means. And we're going to be seeing what this 2TB drive can give us, because... When it first arrived on the scene, the PNY series, the CS3040 that we've reviewed previously, and that of the C3140, although their architecture was really, really exciting and interesting, featuring an E16 and E18 controller from Faisal respectively, it has to be said that the Faisal controller is actually available from a lot of different brands right now, and probably one of the highest tiers out there, certainly more expensive than this drive, but making bigger, bolder, louder claims, is of course Fire Cuda, the Seagate Fire Cuda drive, which also features the Fire on E18 controller inside. Um, it has a, a 3D TLC NAND, both from Micron, in the case of both of these SSDs, with this one arriving with 96 layer and this one arriving with 176 layer, so that's one big distinction between them. There's data recovery services in that one and a few bits and bobs, and there's a heatsink. But still, nonetheless, we'll keep that on there because we might need that SSD later on for the video. Nevertheless, there is an enormous disparity in price difference between these two SSDs, with this one arriving noticeably lower in price. Arriving in one, two, and even a 4TB drive out there, it arrives at $156, $294, and $789, respective to the one, two, and 4TB, with that last one, including a heatsink as well. That is a noticeable um, decrease in price compared with uh, the Seagate there. Does it mean it's still an SSD or does it involve some sort of compromise there? Because for me, the Firecuda is still the score to beat. But still, nonetheless, this SSD is a hell of a performer. And it's going to be a case of, if this is cheaper, why is it cheaper? And moreover, does it still mean it's a good SSD nevertheless? And I've got to say, everything I've seen about it, and we've already done some early PS5 testing on it, it is just tick, tick, tick is done incredibly well. I'm genuinely looking to get this on the benchmark later on. But let's talk a little bit about the archite architecture. It is a Firezone E18 controller SSD, which isn't quite as special, special as it used to be. It's got that uh, Micron 96 layer NAND inside there. And again, that's 3D TLC NAND. If we open the box up, it's quite an unassuming package there inside again all the information is linked to on the back of the box there if we get the ssd out it's a double-sided 2tb ssd then again the faisal controller is right there in the middle of the ssd let's see if we can get that label off because i think we do want to take a good look at the inside of this ssd and if we remove that label there pop that on the table as you can see in the middle of the ssd there there is our faisal controller underneath there is um, SD RAM there that is DDR4 uh, 2666 megahertz memory that scales with each of the SSD. So 1 gig to 1 TB, 2 gig to 2 um, TB, etc. etc. I hate seagulls. And of course, it's a double sided NAND SSD, so we're absolutely coated in NAND modules there. And again, each of those, this is an 8 NAND uh, SSD there. So again, we're looking at 256 gigabytes per NAND cell there across the SSD. Now, in terms of performance, this SSD makes some incredibly bold claims, something I am going to hold it against when we go through a lot of our testing. The reason being that a lot of you that look at this SSD, if you go on the brand's own website, you will see that they say that this SSD, this 2TB, 
can hit speeds of 7,500 megabytes per second, which is noticeably higher than any other brand out there. On top of that, the reported sequential write activity reaches 6,800. Both of these figures are extraordinarily high. Again, these are possible within a Fison E18 controlled SSD with the right architecture to back it up, but there isn't much information online about how that figure has been hit. I'm willing to bet it's going to be either uh, an i9 or a current gen i7 6 or 8 core. More likely though, a Xeon or some of the new series of Ryzen 9s being utilized there with a huge amount of memory. For my case, I'm going to be using a 6 core 11th gen i5 and 16 gig of DDR4 memory, no GPU card there, and I'm not going to use it as an OS drive. That is going to have its impact on the performance, it has to be said. But I'm quietly confident that we're going to get close to that 7000. Whether we cross it, I'm not convinced because. As good as I like this SSD, when we've looked more and more at its architecture, when we look at the fact that it has great IOPS rates at 1 million, we've seen that it is uh, 2 million the hours MTBF, and even the durability seems to be a little higher at 0.38 than other SSDs at 0.3. All of those factors seemingly indicate to me that it's going to be a, a high uh, response and performance drive. That I'm assuming that cache is going to empty out lovely and quick. And indeed, that durability is high enough. SSDs that I see that have those kind of stats, when I put them in my test machine, because they're so level and balanced across all those different services, they tend not to crack 7,000 in those attempts, unless we really tweak it, which we don't want to do too much. Now, this SSD, this 2TB, as mentioned, knocks around for about 290 maybe even $280, which for 2TB at PCI Gen 4, although expensive, is noticeably cheaper, certainly, than the Seagate Fire Cuda, but also other SSDs on the market that start at 2TB at 399 and don't have some of the hardware specification promises of this SSD. But of course, one of the other reasons that this SSD may well have gone onto your radar because a lot of people who may have heard of PNY and their XLR8 gamer series, there are ones that haven't. One of the main reasons for that may well be this. This is the PS5 heatsink. We've got a full hardware review and temperature testing of this. It should already be live. If not, it should be live in the next day or so. And PNY are working on bundles for this. Now, this SSD is PS5 compatible. We've done bench testing. They should be live as well. If they're not, they'll arrive the next day or so. And the PS5 testing, this thing did not let up. Indeed, when we did our testing with the more affordable E16 controller, CS3040, that SSD ticked all the boxes as well. But it's the fact that they, uh, PNY, have, Paris, New York, uh, have once again become one of the brands that have jumped on the PS5 compatibility bandwagon with their own SSD that sort of looks a bit like a McLaren brake pedal. I've said that before. But if you're already considering the PNY SSD and you're getting it in your PS5, can't vouch for this thing enough. If you are already looking at the PNY heatsink and you don't know which SSD to go for, you've already decided you want to go for a 7000 megs Fison controller SSD, I can tell you right now, even before the benchmarking, this thing stands up. Again, this before I've done my benchmarks and we've looked at other reviews online, this SSD does prove itself. It just may not hit some of those arguably very very high reported benchmarks that the brand has been saying but of course let's get this ssd inside my test machine let's find out what it can do what it can't do and see how it compares with other fires on ssds in the market such as the adling a95 and the fire cuda 530 maybe even the sabren as well let's get it inside there and see just what it can do Okay, so we've made our way over to the desktop where we're going to be testing our CS3140 drive. We've updated the firmware to the latest version. If you do want to update yours, they've got their own SSD toolbox on board. I apologise if there is a bit of noise there in the background as well. I'm next to two NASs that I'm currently testing for another video coming up soon. I've kind of limited the noise there in the background, but it's very hard to control it all. And of course, we are using OBS, something I will touch on later. But in today's video, as mentioned, we are um, looking at that PNY. We're going to be testing the following software. We've already got Crystal Disk Info there to give us some idea about the temperature. 
as you can see i've had the ssd running um for a fair odd number of hours i've already been utilizing it for other stuff so it's had a good little warm burn in there uh, we're going to be looking at the following applications we can look at atto as i open the or these applications the screen will go black as it requires a kind of windows verification so we're going to be using atto there we're going to be using aja later on we're also going to be taking advantage of ASSSD uh, for the more kind of intensive SSD stuff there. And of course, for the conventional kind of semi-realistic read writes, we're going to be using Crystal Disk. Those are the tools that we're going to be looking at. And of course, we are also going to be looking at temperatures as well. So for example, if we go into here, we open up the graph there, we can look at temperatures there. I can see a bunch of SSDs inside my system right now. We only will look at SSD 6 right now. We don't really want to bother with the rest of them. So let's get only number 6 on there. But again, we could ignore most of the other, other of the others because they're being used in other tests there. But I'll go through and get that sorted by the end. We're starting on at 21 uh, Celsius. And again, 21 Celsius is what we're starting with now, even though the system's been on for about 20 minutes. When the intensive read writes, that's going to creep up. Uh, and we are using the Elateng M2 NVMe heatsink. So, um, much like my other videos, I am going to conduct all of the read write testing and then come back soon and take about an hour. I'm going to leave a one minute break between every test. The reason we're doing it that way is because OBS is an aggressive little application that will impact on our read write performance there now again i could use a capture card but the capture card that i do generally use for the channel is being used by ps5 content right now so i apologize for that being out of commission for this but don't worry all the tests you're going to see are legit and they are auto all utilizing the hardware architecture we're looking at today the pc for those who aren't aware as mentioned in the intro this isn't some powerhouse uh, 9 uh, or amd ryzen 9 this is an 11th gen i5 uh, it's slightly higher than a conventional PC, uh, and that is a 6-core 11th gen processor with 16 gig of DDR4 memory, and we're running Windows 10 Pro. The OS SSD, because we are not using this as an OS SSD, is a Seagate Fire CUDA SATA, but that won't impact our results. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and start my first tests with Crystal Disk. So I'm going to fast forward an hour and bring you guys back to the results. Right, so we've completed our testing and overall I've got to say the results are pretty close to what the brand have said but I think if you are looking at buying the CS3140 it is worth highlighting that you're going to need quite a powerful system to reach some of these reported speeds. Now it's worth remembering we are looking at the 2TB drive as you can see 7500 megabytes per second read 6850 megabytes per second write and that is utilizing the very latest firmware but do bear in mind you are going to need a hefty rig to hit those numbers now remember i already discussed my system here the fact that we are running that six core 11th gen i5 and the speeds i was getting didn't quite hit that limit if we go straight in with our first test there this was taking advantage of crystal disk benchmarks let's get the crystal disk speeds up there and these were utilizing a 1 gig, a 4 gig, and a 16 gig test. Now, we've got the mixed test there, but these are largely the sequentials we're going to look at there. And as you can see, looking at these speeds, we didn't crack 7,000 on this system. Now, again, 7,000 megs is still a very high number, and these are still, let's be honest about this, very impressive numbers, particularly in the write department. These write speeds here of 6,700 are incredibly high compared to a lot of other vendors, but still that sequential read is still less than that reported maximum there from the brand themselves. Yes, we're not running some high-end uh, Ryzen system, if we bring that page back up, but still nonetheless, it is hitting that write speed very comfortably. I think we're only around um, less than 100 megabytes per second out in terms of write on all of those tests there. But still, I'm a little bit disappointed that we weren't able to hit that read, particularly when you look at some of the SSDs that we've tested previously. And if we look at some of the others we looked at that have a similar architecture to this one. And again, probably the big gun that everyone talks about, of course, is that Seagate Fire Cuda 530. And the Fire Cuda 530, when we look at the crystal disc there, we can see it was able to hit that 7,000. But it was still nowhere near as high as the right on this drive. We are comparing a 1TB and a 2TB, of course, which does make a big, uh, you know, quite a 
noticeable difference, but still these are in great write numbers here. It's just those read numbers that I'm surprised that an identical setup here that I've tested on other SSDs that could hit 7000 was not achieved here on the XLR8 SSD from PNY. Now it is also worth highlighting before we go any further that I have tested um, the kind of uh, value series PCIe 4 SSD from this brand. Uh, earlier last year, I believe in summertime, I did test the CS3040. And if we look at the results there, hopefully you can see those on screen. You can see there at the bottom that across the 1 gig, 4 gig and 16 gig test, we are able to achieve, I know it's quite small for you there, I hope you can see that, do full screen this, that the 500 gig model, the lowest end of the affordable SSD there, noticeably lower in price, those were the specifications to give you some indication about the utilization of a Fizon E16 controller SSD versus the Fizon E18 that we're using here for the tests on the 3140 SSD. And we will be coming back to these PNY 500 gig results later on. But for now, let's move away from Crystal Disk and head over to Atto. Now, Atto is a little bit, I'll come back to the temps later on. Atto, the results are always going to be a little bit lower because the way it does sustained and file size differences uh, between that of Crystal Disk. But I would say that Atto gives a lot more of a real world approach to a lot of the results. Crystal Disk kind of gives a more idealized version of the results with the mixed performance probably being the most accurate real-world results possible. But when it comes to Atto, we get a little bit more relatable there, particularly for you business users. Now, when we look at these results from Atto, we can see there that the maximum sequential read we saw across the spaces, maximum 6.58, 6.57 and 6.58 again so again we're seeing that six and a half thousand being hit there in those slightly more relatable tests and in terms of write we still saw performance in the six gigabytes per second there uh, maxing out once again at around 6.34 over here 6.34 and over here 6.33 so great results on that and if we flick over to the iops of course again we're not using the smaller files are here, we're still using quite chunky files. Consequently, the, the results we're seeing are not, not as good as someone might see if we were using a pure IOPS test with IO meter. But for now, we're still seeing great solid numbers and definitely numbers I'd like to see from a PCIe SSD right there. And again, we get to more detail on the IOPS in the NAS Compare article linked in the description. So if we come out of this, we're going to another more relatable SSD tool. This is, of course, ASSSD. And again, this is one where it's a lot harsher in terms of its um, activity. If we get that there on screen, we're testing a 1 gig, a 3 gig, and a 5 gig file. And as you can see, it balanced out quite neatly at the 5,000s there, all the way through the board. And again, we will look at the IOP shortly. But once again, if we go back into this tool here, and we'll bring up some of those results against the more affordable SSD we're able to see moving it into five three and there if we look compare them up and down against one another you can see a notable increase there between the affordable one at the bottom there that 3040 and that of the 3140 there there is a price difference between them but you can definitely see where a lot of that money has gone same goes in the three gig test and of course once again they're on the five gig tests Again, a big margin of increase there between them and definitely showing off why the 3140 is the superior SSD. Again, we do still have to factor in it's 500 gig versus a 2TB drive, which means more NAND chips to read from, but still a marketable increase, even if you look at the specifications of comparing the 1TB one, uh, one on both ranges. Now, if we switch things up and make our way over to IOPS in this same tool, what we'll do is now we're going to get rid of these tests here that we were utilizing with the value series PNY. And we're going to go to a lot more of a relatable SSD here. We're going to go for the 2TB AdLink A95. This is a Fizon E16 controller SSD. So again, this is going to be a little bit more relatable for us here. And we'll get those IOPS back up on screen. And again, we'll put them just underneath each of these. As we can see, if we go into the 1 gig SSD there, we can see that it definitely outpaced that of the AdLink there in the majority of ways. There was, in the 4K third, 
we can see a dip there in terms of read, but write was where it was consistent. Both of these are 2TB SSDs, but again, overall on point, the PNY took it. If we have a look at the three, t uh, the three gig test there, things are a little bit more balanced with the 4K third IOPS there, definitely overall uh, improving more on the AdLink and a higher score over on that 3 gig test as well. And if we make our way onto the end, once again, similar results that we saw on the 5 gig test there. So again, this is what I mean about the system. Those read stats, although very, very high, I think you would need to have a very powerful machine to hit that possible uh, maximum 7,500 sequential read. So I think most real world users are not going to hit that. I think the majority of PCIe 4 systems and given the kind of modern nature of most PCIe 4 MOBOs resulting in the CPUs right now, most CPUs being quite you know middle of to high range, you're going to hit close if not over that 7000, but I question whether you're going to hit 7500 uh, very easily. And all the way through this test, write has been the thing that's really stood out for me. Of all the SSDs that I've been testing over these few months, uh, at least within the PCIe 4 generation, I'm certainly going to give props to this SSD over many others that I've seen in terms of write activity. Yes, it's still a 2TB drive, but even if this was a lower capacity, everything we're seeing here shows that the write performance on this is certainly of a higher tier than most of the SSDs we've talked about. And we're gonna end the testing here looking at AJA. Now, as I've mentioned in previous videos, AJA isn't really suitable for traditional benchmarking of an SSD because of the sustained activity that AJA has. Where it constantly repeats the test. So we've run a single test here and ignore the top numbers. What we're looking at is the bottom numbers. We're looking at these graphs. These show us not only the peak performance, but how well it aligned. And if we see a big dip in that yellow line, because we will see the dip as we go through bigger file types, the 16 gig here at the top, for example, showed that that cache was being emptied. Another thing about the PMY SSD that has stood out that we've talked about uh, more in our written review than I uh, have previously is that the caching um, emptying on this SSD has been particularly impressive. The SLT cache has been ready a lot quicker than a lot of SSDs that I've seen in the past. And if you have a large rotation of data in your uh, kind of data use environment, this is a little bit more towards business than you content creators, maybe as a scratch disk or... Uh, uh, for large editing purposes where you've got a good refresh of content quite you know daily this is going to prove itself quite substantially and also this is a good balance of read versus write again i know it's a 2tb drive but i think even in the 1tb we would have seen these nice sustained um through lines of that write activity with little or no drop something that when we test other ssds we do tend to see the write drop to be quite significant more than a third of the way through the test and uh, the last thing i want to talk about is the temperature of this ssd now in my other tests as mentioned we never test these ssds without a heat sink yes the heat sink we're using is a third party heat sink from elatang it's a simple ten dollar heat sink we do that so there's no bells and whistles we're not using uh, the first party heat sink for this because a number of you may not buy that and it's also a very chunky heat sink indeed but I've got to say, in terms of temperature, this SSD with that simple L10 heatsink really held its own. Um, kicking off at the beginning of testing, um, uh, around about, you know, uh, kicking the PC off at boot at 17, and then resting at a nice casual 20 to 21 C. During all of our tests with each of these spikes here, these are individual tests that we conducted, the highest this SSD ever got was up here at 44, and that was during the final stages of our um, ATO testing there. So again, 44 is a very respectable temperature. Just to put that into perspective, if we make our way into another SSD, let's go for the Team Force Cardia there, and we open up the temperature test there, we can see that this one, with exactly the same heatsink, started off at a similar 20, let's bring that full screen, started off at a very similar 20 degrees, but very quickly headed into the 40s and 50s. And although the line looks very, very similar, it's worth remembering that the, um, P, uh, that the team group T-Force Cardia of a similar architecture peaked out at around 55. 
Whereas, as mentioned, this SSD from PMY peaked at an incredibly respectable 44C, bearing in mind these SSDs work at their very best under 50C, and this was the most intense operation that I could do to this SSD to get benchmarks. So again, good marks there for temperature use. So, let's summarize everything we've learned today. First and foremost, I think it is worth highlighting that the um, overall write performance on this SSD, uh, sorry, the read performance of this SSD is a little optimistic. I think 3,500 is kind of an out of a traditional utilization benchmark, and I think this should maybe get brought down to 7,002, maybe 7,003, in line with a lot of other FISA on um, E18 SSDs. But the write, on the other hand, is definitely something to write home about, with even that 1TB sitting there at a comfortable 5,600, and I think it would likely exceed that. And indeed, the IOPS performance we saw comfortably sitting always within the five to 800,000 read-write um, dependent, we're definitely seeing some great uh, kind of um, performance of this SSD in terms of write activity and some highly respectable um, read activity there. Just bear in mind that right now, the PNY SSD is probably one of the more affordable uh, gamer SSDs there, um, LR, um, XLR8 series, whether you're utilizing it in a PS5 with that new heatsink that they released recently or a PC environment, this is definitely a value SSD right now. And I'm seeing it floating around on your Amazons and like at a decent little price drop with WDC Gate and Samsung dominating the market. One of the ways in which brands like this are staying competitive is that price point. And therefore, if you are considering the XLRA SSD, I don't think you need to hesitate if that price point sounds good to you. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. Um, if you want some free advice or are still not 100% certain which SSD you need to buy for your setup, take advantage of the free advice section over on NAS Compares. Genuinely free, man by two humans, me and Eddie the web guy. We answer as many inquiries as we can but we do have lives so it may take us an extra day or so to answer your inquiry but again it's a completely free service we don't do anything with your email couldn't care less about your email there's donate buttons use them ignore them it's up to you but otherwise i'll see you next time